And with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. My name is Sal Gilberto. I am a marketing director at Everbridge. I will be your moderator for today's presentation. So welcome, everyone, to a to whoops. Screen went all the way for a second. Well, welcome, everyone, to Effective Active Shooter and Mass Violence Response Planning and Communications. You'll be hearing from our special guest presenter, Tom Vivia, a former special agent at the FBI. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, just want to go quickly through the agenda. There's some housekeeping items that I'd like to go over to make sure that you have the best webinar experience that you can. Then we're going to meet our speaker. Then we're going to pass the, pass the presentation over to our speaker for the Effective Active Shooter and Mass Violence Communications and Response. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some strategies to be prepared. Um, and then we'll do our live Q&A. So that's an important one. Please continue to ask your questions throughout the course of the presentation via the WebEx chat, and we will save all the questions till the end. So I'll get into that in a second. So a couple of things. Um, everybody asked this question, so I'll go ahead and answer it now. I'll try to repeat it at the end as well, but we are recording today's session. I repeat, we are recording today's session. If you do miss any of it, or if you have to, you know, if you have to step away, or if you want to share it, um, we will make that available. What we'll be doing is we'll be emailing out the recording uh, in a couple of days. We need a couple of days to process it and get it up on our site. So Friday or Monday, you should have a recording of today's session in your hand. So please do feel free to take notes, but if you do miss anything, you will have that recording. But you also receive a copy of the slides um, and any additional resources that we do think um, may be of use to you. As I mentioned, we are saving questions until the end of the session. So in order to ask questions, you can ask throughout the presentation using the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, go ahead and ask those questions. Um, I will try to save the questions until, I will be saving the questions till the end. We'll try to get to as many as possible, but um, we will do a live Q&A at the end. So let's meet our speaker, Tom Vivia. Um, Tom, welcome to today's webinar. Let me unmute you so you can say hi to the audience. That would be good. Uh, so um, Tom is a, a principal at 302 Consulting. Oh, keeps keep jumping around here with the go to webinar. So um, you are a principal at 302 Consulting. You are a former special agent at the FBI, dealing in issues that uh, a lot of issues that we at Everbridge call um, critical uh, critical incidents. Um, so you you know you have a, a wide range of experience that I think will be of service to our audience today. And you are a, um, a former New York State trooper. So, Tom, how are you doing today? Hi, good, Al. good evening, Sal. Um, I'm doing quite well. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Awesome. Well, we're very glad to have you. We're eager to get started with your presentation. So with that, I'm going to make you the presenter. So if you want to show your screen. I'll let you know when. Perfect. All right. How are we doing? Everything's good. You sound good, and I can see your screen. So please go ahead. Wonderful. Uh, good afternoon and good morning, everybody. Um, I'm really glad to be here and have the opportunity to um, give you this presentation. I recently retired from the FBI back in March after a, a very, um, very good 26-year career. Um, I always considered myself as having been blessed with the career that I've had and some lessons that I've been able to take out of that and hopefully I can pass on some of these lessons to you today. So we're here to um, stand by. We're here to talk about the the threat of mass violence and it's one of those things that seems to be ever present um, you know and it comes in different forms you know we had the the terrorist related attack at the Pulse nightclub a year ago. We've had attack on law enforcement in Baton Rouge about a year ago in July. Um, just on the 10th of September, we had a mass killing that was a result of a domestic dispute. And obviously the most recent thing is the, um, the attempted bombing in, in the UK. And the, what we're trying to prepare for comes in various forms. It's sometimes it's that, that targeted violence that a, of a school shooter, which also happened recently, or it could be a domestic issue that's turned into um, workplace violence. So, they all end up having the, you know, they start from a, a different source, but they end up having the same impact on us in law enforcement and in the, in the community. Yeah, uh, before we continue on, I'm just curious of, about my audience. Um, Sal's got a poll. I want to ask you, how many people are on this webinar today that are law enforcement 
that are developing a, res a response plan for active shooters, or um, are you non-law enforcement and you're in charge of developing a reaction plan to um, an active shooter or a mass violence, or are you just somebody that's just kind of curious and interested in the topic? We'll give you a chance to go ahead and um, answer that poll. <clears throat> All right, so we have a, a pretty good mix of, uh, of people here. That's good. That's good to know. Um, so we'll go ahead and continue on here. When, we, when we've looked at um, active shooters throughout my career, a lot of times we've, I like to call it the traditional approach. We've, um, when I was the senior team leader for our SWAT team, we were always looking at tactics of um, actually addressing the threat. It wasn't until um, I was responsible for the FBI response to Sandy Hook from the tactical side of it that I learned that there's a great deal more to dealing with an event like that than just training in um, in tactics. You know, I always look at the um, the active shooter tactics that we used to train was just a small part of the lessons that I learned over the uh, over the course of that event and some of the other events that we've had here in Connecticut that we've been able to study. In uh, August of 2010, we had a workplace shooting at a, um, a beer distribution facility that took the lives of uh, 10 people. And we, we, we learned a great deal from that. It's not just the tactics that to stop violence that, we're, that we have to train in. We have to look at interagency communication. One of the effective things that we had at Sandy Hook is the fact that I had a Connecticut State Police radio assigned to me. I was able to, to get on their radio network and communicate directly with the troop that was responsible for that area and the team leaders from the Connecticut State um, Police Emergency Services Unit. We learned a great deal about scene management. There's going to be more than one scene. It's going to, it can be the actual shooting scene, it can be parking lots, it can be hospitals, it can be other areas. So there's a lot to that. Consequence management, the fallout from, uh, from one 10 minute activity inside that school had lasting impacts on people. The follow on missions that we never, never anticipated that we may have, covering the funerals that day for each of the, each of the victims or that following week, and then some of the long term impacts. But really, it all boiled down to an overall crisis management approach to the event, not just looking at um, one aspect. Now, that may be our responsibility. We may be responsible for uh, developing um, active shooter tactics and training those, but that's just one aspect of the entire event. So what I want to talk about is taking the crisis management approach to, um, to dealing with and responding to either an active shooter or a mass, mass casualty. Crisis management has kind of a, it's more of a holistic approach. It's understanding all the parts of the event and how they are interconnected and how they interrelate with each other. So it's kind of a beginning to an end kind of approach. The crisis management approach can, can be for a singular event and a singular location, or it can be used for multiple events in multiple locations. And really, once you start getting to multiple events in multiple locations, you really need to take that, that uh, crisis management approach to the entire event. It's used in major case investigations. I was the team leader for a um, child abduction rapid deployment team. And what I learned from those deployments to missing children is oftentimes that can turn into, that can turn into a crisis for whatever agency is dealing with that. It's, um, it's large scale, it's multifaceted, and if you take the crisis management approach to that, it helps you manage the entire event, not just the investigation of it. It can be used for natural disasters, obviously. You know, we have the hurricanes that are going on right now, so we take this overall holistic approach for those. So the real question is, how do we implement um, the crisis management approach to uh, dealing, planning the response to an active shooter and developing a communications plan? Well, the first part is to understand that there are dis different phases to um, the response to an event. It's the pre-event planning and training, 
the notification phase, mobilization, employment, demobilization, resupply, and retraining. And those are those last two are often overlooked because once the incident has been resolved, we tend to go back to our day-to-day -day activities. We may go back to patrol if we're working uniform. We may just go back to our lives if we were part of a um, if we were at a school where an event like this happened. But there's there's a, a process to which we we want to go through that demobilization and that resupply. So to kind of talk about the um, the first phase, that pre-event planning and training. This is where it's important that we define in that pre-event planning. We have to define our area of responsibility. And for a police department, it would be Obviously, their jurisdiction, if it's a town police, then they would be looking at the township, and we look at those boundaries. But within those boundaries, we want to look at different types of events that could occur. Are we, you know, are we planning for an active shooter at a school? Um, are we looking at a, um, you know, a concert venue that may have um, some sort of natural disaster event? So this planning process can needs to be start with where is your area of responsibility? What are some of the types of events that you want to plan for? And then you want to identify those locations. If each, each location and each event can have its own plan, but the template can be overlaid at various locations. We want to identify the staging areas where, if something happens at a particular venue, where would we have our resources begin to stage? Because what's real, the reality is, as an event unfolds, there are going to be the people that you expect there and then there's going to be people showing up that you weren't expecting. And the best way to manage that is to have an idea of where everything's going to go before the event occurs. What resources do you have available? If you're planning to respond to an active shooter or a mass casualty event, you have to define what resources are available at the time that you're planning for it. So we always tell people, agencies when we would do um, training for them, you know, when you identify an event, it's important to also identify if the event has, happens at a particular time. So, for example, 3 o'clock on a Wednesday, what resources are available at 3 o'clock on a Wednesday compared to what resources are available at 1 a.m. on a Wednesday? Who do you have available? See, those resources, that's a very important part of the pre-event planning and training. What agencies do you expect to respond? I've had conversations with some agencies when we've done tabletop planning for them, and they've um, went under the assumption that certain agencies would respond at a given time and only to find out later during a training event that resources would from that agency wouldn't have been available at the time given. So it's really important to get a, a, a really good understanding of what you have um, available, what you're expecting and what you have available. And then what agencies would actually respond, the ones that you that would respond that you didn't expect. So um, one of the things that I realized during Sandy Hook was I saw uniforms there that I hadn't recognized before. There were agencies within the state that um, I had no interaction with because investigatively our paths had never crossed. So some people are going to show up that you're just not actually prepared for, and you have to have an idea of what you're going to do with them and how you can task them. Also, what resources will they be bringing with them at the time of the event? You know, is it a bear cat? Is it a command post vehicle? Um, are you expecting them to bring certain breaching equipment? You know, these are all things that need to be kind of laid out ahead of time. And then identifying key locations at the particular event. And what I mean by this is, you know, defining casualty collection points. Where are you going to have, where are you going to bring victims to that have been injured or wounded during an event? Where are the rally points and staging areas for various tactical teams, EMS, and things like that? Incident command post, you, you know, the incident command post is going to be where some of the decision makers will be that are dealing with the immediate issue of, re of clearing the building or clearing an area. Where do you want your investigative command post? Those two shouldn't intermingle. Um, you want to have those people downrange that are going to be dealing with the, with the crisis at hand, and then there's going to be the, the initiation of the investigation that's going to go on, and it's best to have those two separate and have those not co-located. Family reunification locations, you want to have that um, not at the crisis site. It's best to get them pulled away from the crisis site. That way um, you can keep the two issues separate. Where are you going to put the media? That's a big issue. And we try to keep the media at a staging area that's not close to the, the investigative command post or the incident command post. And then communications. How are you going to communicate with everybody? 
this is really an important part of the pre-event planning. And then as you develop the plans, uh, you want to have, there's going to be two different types. There's going to be the emergency action plan. That's where if there's an active shooter, who's going to respond to deal with the threat? And that's going to be the emergency action. And then there's the deliberate action. The deliberate action plan is going to be more about how do we deal with the consequences after the event and um, it's a more deliberate. I look at the emergency action as being hasty movements and then the deliberate actions, the consequence management being what do we do once we've, how do we handle and what do we do once we've, we've stopped the killing, we've stopped the loss of life. Now it's time to be very deliberate in our movements and we are, will be much more effective and much more efficient that way. And then obviously the, the training part. Once the plan is developed, it's important to train this plan. And, you know, one of the things that I'm a big fan of is tabletop exercises. One of the challenges that we have is when you have 24-7 coverage of a particular uh, area of responsibility, you have the, the limitations of overtime, getting all your personnel together to actually to conduct a full-scale exercise can be a challenge. But one of the things that's really effective and I, that I've noticed in my career is having a tabletop exercise, getting everybody together that is a stakeholder in the event or what, who we believe is going to be a stakeholder and having them at the table and starting that communication before the event. The last thing we want to do is try to make decisions during the crisis so that we could have the decisions that we could have made in advance of the event. And tabletop exercises are a great way to do that. And it has to be anyone that would possibly respond. I was developing a tabletop exercise on an active shooter for a, um, another agency close by me. And as we talked about who would be involved, the, they wanted to limit the, the involvement to only a certain population of responders. And as I did the analysis and as I developed the script, I thought through who would be responding. I realized that there were a couple agencies that had been excluded. And I think it was just an inadvertent thing. And I, I raised the issue with the agency, the, uh, the training coordinator, and was able to convince them to have that person or a representative from those other agencies be involved. And as we went through the, um, the scenario and the uh, lead agency was making assumptions about what equipment was available, that's when some of those, those agencies that were going to be ex normally would have been excluded were able to say that the equipment wouldn't have been available at that time. So it's a way of walking through and kind of game planning how the response would unfold using a real scenario and real timing and getting a good understanding of who's going to be there and what equipment they're going to bring. And that's a very important part. Now, the other thing, too, is communications exercises. We understand that communications is always the challenge during a, a, um, a crisis. As the team leader for a SWAT team, every time we did a, um, a uh, tactical entry or a tactical operation, one of the things that tended to fail the most were our communications. Radios would fail. Batteries would, would go dead. The network might not work. So it's always important that as you come up with a communications plan that you take the time to exercise that plan. And it can be, you know, sometimes it's simplicity is where the beauty is. It can be simply having um, representatives on their comm systems just talking to each other, saying, hey, can you hear me? I can hear you, and testing it at various venues, what works and what doesn't work, and then the adaptability. And when we were doing a, um, an exercise at one of the malls here in Connecticut, we did a walk through the mall. We anticipated that our radios would work, and then when we got into the basement of the mall, we realized that the concrete structures prevented our radios from getting to the outside. So we were able to pre-plan for the, the deployment of a mobile repeater. And that was really important because that helped us communicate what was going on inside the crisis site, outside to the incident command post, and then subsequently to the investigative command post. So comm exercises are very important. Command post exercises, when it comes to the active shooter, they're, they're valuable. Command post exercises can be, have their most value is when we're in the investigative phase and we're trying to process intel coming in or leads coming in and how they're getting handled. But they, too, are very important. And, it, and it's not as much of a drain on resources having a command post exercise. And then, obviously, full-scale exercises are really where the rubber meets the road. It's where we bring equipment out. We, we look for functionality. We can see what, 
how everything works, the time that it takes to deploy, and really how long it may take to set up a full command post. And this will be part of those deliberate actions. So as we move on, the next phase is notification. Really, the notification phase can be is a very critical initiation of the response. And it starts with simply it could be dispatching on-duty personnel that are that are on the road and getting them rolling that way to to take care of those those um, emergency action plans. It's the activation of specialized teams such as SWAT, EMS, things like that, crime scene. Request for mutual aid, whether you're on the hotline or you have some other means by which you would request other agencies to deploy. Mass notification systems, wanting to get those out to the off-duty personnel and personnel or maybe the parts of the people that are not part of it. You know, mass notification systems for um, notifying the public that there's an event going on that you want them to avoid. Now that goes both. That can cut both ways. There, you'll have the curiosity seekers that are going to that are going to deploy, not because they are in a position to help or that they want to help, but simply because they want to watch. And that'll also can impact how media deploys. Social media can be very effective for keeping um, keeping people, uh, the public in, in particular, aware of what's going on. I know a lot of schools are utilizing social media to uh, announce lockdowns and, and as a way of blasting out that message and getting getting the message out and it's very important that we leverage that as best we can. Um, the big thing, just getting back to the social media part notification, it's important that once these notifications go out, all messaging then goes through one, one point of contact and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Mobilization, this is where, this is that phase where we get people rolling and we get them to the crisis site and we have them start doing the job that they're supposed to do. And when we're talking about mobilization, it's kind of as you're in the planning process, we want to talk about how are we getting there. And I know this may be a simple, um, you know, the answer could be, well, we're going to drive there. But when it comes to specialized teams or, um, or um, special units, you know, I, the question generally is, how are we getting there collectively as a team? By what route will we get there? As we've done some of the planning for some of the, the critical infrastructures here in Connecticut, we know that certain routes will likely be blocked getting to the facility that we're, that we're going to. So mobilization and getting there can also include by what route are you going to go? Are you going to go as a team, as a collective, or are you going to piecemeal? The challenge with sending... Um, a specialized team individually is we start to see kind of the log jam of vehicles showing up so it's important to understand how you're getting there what equi what equipment will be needed in the in the FBI we had a lot of equipment that wouldn't necessarily be needed at, for the immediate response but we would want that equipment um, when we started moving to that deliberate phase whether it's uh, laptops for a, a mobile command post whether it's going to be uh, portable repeaters some of these things, you're not going to necessarily need a portable repeater to eliminate the threat, but it will be needed when it's time for consequence management. So as you develop your mobilization plan, you want to know timing and what you'll be bringing. Who's responsible for getting it there? We've, these are conversations that we have all the time. And I see a lot of it in, um, when it comes to uh, some of the mobile command posts that we've utilized with various um, state and local law enforcement agencies on a kidnapping deployment they'll offer up a piece of equipment and then I overhear the discussions of who is actually qualified to drive it, how is it going to get there, and how long is it going to take, whether or not the person's on vacation and in the area to get it there. So these are all things that need to be kind of laid out in a plan when you're talking about mobilization. And then what, obviously what is the priority equipment? For us it would be breaching equipment and things to, to, um, to facilitate the tactical operation, but it, it can be um, you know, is a mobile command post necessary for that immediate response? Maybe not, but it's definitely the priority when it comes to deliberate actions. So these are things that can all be um, planned out ahead of time. And then what are your expect expectations from other agencies? And this is where, during the tabletop exercises, we've had the conversation. Um, one agency that doesn't have a Bearcat may be expecting another agency to bring the Bearcat. And that agency, the, the agency that's going to bring it may not even be responsible for it. So it's clear that when, when, we're, when you're developing your plan and you're working with your stakeholders that 
these conversations are, are being had. Now the employment phase. The employment phase is one of those things that's kind of self-evident. Patrol for an active shooter, they're going to respond, they're going to be employed as addressing the active shooter tactics. And that may be the first contact team going in, moving to contact, eliminating the threat, but then having follow-on forces. I've been part of live fire, or not live fire, but um, uh, full-scale exercises where uniform patrol shows up to move to contact, the next team shows up, and their responsibility is recovery of um, the injured, and they they move into that move to contact phase. And it's uh, it's interesting to watch. And really, what ends up happening is it turns out that one person needs to be coordinating that that deployment. So as you respond, patrol is going to be take care of their active shooter tactic, but somebody needs to be at the breach, coordinating the rest of it. So that first that first supervisor is going to be delegating how the employment goes. SWAT will be in will be utilized in an emergency services unit as follow-on forces. They'll be employed in a different capacity than what patrol may be. Emergency medical services will be employed in a medical capacity but may not enter that initially enter that warm zone. So that needs to be laid out. How are you going to define the areas? Where are the ca casualty collection points and how are you going to how are you going to employ them at the crisis site? And then incident command personnel, those are the people that are going to start the organizational structure. They're going to be the ones delegating and making decisions on how to resolve the crisis. And it needs to follow a, a formal chain. And really the key is designating an incident commander. And oftentimes what I've noticed over the years, when there's overwhelming resources that show up at a crisis, it can make it, it can become a challenge for whoever's in charge from that agency. And I've been on a couple different deployments where there's been potential active shooters. And one of the things that's been most helpful is when we've showed up to assist a local police department, we clearly state to them that they're the incident commander and we're there to help support them. And that kind of lays out the chain of command from there on. But if it's something that you can lay out ahead of time through these conversations and planning, then it, it eases a lot of stress and it makes the decision making go a lot quicker. Crime scene um, technicians will be utilized, they'll be employed in a different way. Command post personnel will be will be utilized in the investigative phase and crisis management phase. And then obviously major case investigators are just another component that will that will be employed during a, the event. So as we go on, supporting agencies will be um, will have various capacities, but it's important that as we look at how they're going to be utilized, it's, it's important to have an understanding. Oftentimes agencies will show up or, or self-deployers will show up off-duty and it's important to have an idea of how you want to utilize them. And a lot of these lessons, there's a, um, an agency in uh, Connecticut that's developed, that has developed a, um, a plan in advance with all the surrounding agencies as to how many resources will be deployed at a given time and how they will be employed. And it's important to have that organization up front, and it makes better use of your time, and it aids in a quicker resolution of the crisis. So another important phase is actually the demobilization phase. It's the phase that we're going to talk about how are we going to, how are we going to um, resolve the crisis. Once, once the crisis itself is resolved, how do we pull back from there? And it's, it, it's more than just um, everybody just going, packing up and going home. There needs to be an orderly process to it. And it's all based on a couple things. Team will, teams will demobilize as tasks are completed. It, it may occur at different times. A SWAT team, for example, in Sandy Hook, our SWAT team was done before the investigative phases were done. So we look at how are we going to have an orderly removal of people, personnel from the crisis site and when are we going to do that. And what's, in, what's important is that as we do this, um, we consider the fact that some of, those, some of those teams may be withdrawn from the immediate crisis, but they may be held over for follow-on missions. Uh, we, we know that in an active shooter, oftentimes the shooter will, will have um, – murdered the person that's most likely to prevent them from uh, engaging in a, a, this criminal act. So for example, Adam Lonzo was 
a good example. He shot and killed his mother. She was the person that he did it the night before. She was the person most likely to stand in his way. So you may have a follow-on mission there. You may SWAT may have other locations to clear. Um, you know, in the in the Aurora, Colorado shooter, they ended up having to go to his apartment and clear his apartment for um, IEDs that were there. So as we go through, the uh, the demobilization has to be a positive release by the incident commander. The incident commander has to know what teams are ready to be released and whether or not they can be released. And that the incident commander may know that there's another mission or may want to hold them in reserve in the event that there's another mission. So as you go through this, the pro planning out that demobilization is, a very, is also a critical step in the planning. And then obviously now the last phase is that resupply and retraining. So this may not seem like it's a, um, that it should be a, um, a formal or structured phase of the deployment, but it really critically is. When I was uh, in college, I was an EMT working on a, um, an ambulance service, and this was how we actually ended up, ended each of our, our, um, our runs. We would, once, the, once the patient was turned over to uh, a medical facility, we would have to resupply the ambulance. It, was, it became self-evident. But sometimes in law enforcement, we don't necessarily look at that. And resupply and retraining can take on many things, many meanings. But one of the most important parts is the a critical after-action review of the event. It's where we talk about what worked. And it's important to do this uh, kind of a hot wash right after the event. With our SWAT team, oftentimes we would do a, uh, after we've done an entry, we would step outside of the breach. And before we, um, when we got back to our staging area, we would do a quick after action. Hey, what'd you see? What'd you do? And it was a way of talking through um, what tactics worked, what adjustments needed to be made. And it was a way for us to improve our, our efficacy. Lessons learned. It's important that, you know, as you go through this, we, you look at the lessons learned. For me, Sandy Hook was one of those things where I, you know, for weeks afterwards, talking to other team leaders across the FBI about what we experienced, what we saw, what we could do different. And um, those lessons learned are, are an important part of modification and adjustment to the plan. And really, when you do an after action, you want to focus on a couple things. You know, what do we do well that we what or what skill do we do that we want to sustain? What skill do we have that we want to improve? And those are our two big ones. How do we how do we become better and how do we stay good at what we're doing? What equipment worked? This is always a big debate amongst SWAT guys. You know, we want to get the latest, greatest toys and um, equipment, and then when it comes time to actually use it, um, it doesn't function quite as well as what we wanted. Another important part is what equipment did we bring that had no utility? What piece of equipment did we bring that ends up sitting on the next to the the breach and never being employed? So some of the equipment that we that we carry may not necessarily be have a purpose or a utility, so there's no point in bringing it with you. And then what modifications to the plan do we need to make? And the big thing about plans, they all fail on first contact is a, is a common expression, and it's true, and that's, you know, it's important that we look at the plan and we look at really the parts that were really effective and the parts that just made no sense. And it's, and it's, the big thing is it's important that we take a critical look at our own performance and not allow ego to get in the way of, of learning. Now communications, this is really, when it comes to communications, it's really, it's a, one of the bigger challenges, especially when we're talking about multi-agents. And our goal is that interoperability. We want to be able to function as one large team where we have communications uh, amongst the, every entity and we're able to coordinate our response. And we'll start with internal communications. This this will be the um, internal communications for me. And when I say this, I'm talking about the people resolving the crisis, the 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 first responders, the follow-on forces. How are we all communicating with each other? And we start a good a good comms plan with identifying the responding agencies. Who's going to be there at a particular event, or who are we gonna, who are we going to ask to respond? What system do they use? And uh, and you know we're in Connecticut, we've we've gone from the um, HF frequencies, and it's evolved, and now we're in these digital trunk systems. But not all agencies are on the on the same plan. And I always 
view my response to Sandy Hook as being, you know, the fact that it was in an area where I had a radio that I could communicate directly with the primary law enforcement agency that was there uh, clearing the school. If that had happened at any other location, we may not have had that communications integration. I was able to um, switch my radio over to the state police internal tactical frequency, and I was able to do communicate directly with their with their commander and receive taskings for our team and help coordinate that response. That was, that's a big thing for not just being effective, but it's also a safety issue. So identifying what systems they use, you know, identifying the band plan, you know, what frequencies do most agencies use in a given area? What's the connectivity? Is there a way of interconnecting those systems? The, um, in the, my field office here in Connecticut, we had a, a device that we were able to take multiple um, handheld radios from different systems and interconnect those networks. We were able to effectively use it at SWAT operations. We were also able to effectively use it during investigations. When I was the, the uh, task force coordinator for the gang task force in, in Bridgeport, we were able to, to work jointly with the uh, state, statewide narcotics team, and we would take their radio and we would connect it to our system, and we were able to basically communicate through our FBI radios out over their state police network, and it worked ex exceptionally well. Civil support team in Connecticut, the National Guard has a civil support team. It's important to identify agencies such as that. They have the ability of interconnecting multiple radio systems for a crisis, and it's been utilized effectively in, this, in the state of Connecticut. And I would encourage you, as you're developing your communications plan, look for systems or teams that have that capability and make sure that they're invited and they're into the tabletops, into the planning sessions, and that you utilize them um, effectively. Now, the other component is going to be external communications. And when I talk about external communications, I'm talking about, you know, talking to the public. Social media is, you know, everybody's on social media where most people are starting to get their, their news through Twitter, Facebook, and other, other systems, and it's important that we leverage this. Um, I heard the, command, the, uh, the deputy chief of Boston PD talk about the Boston bombing and how they were able to effectively use social media to get the message out to the public and keep the public informed. And, you know, there's, when it comes to communications, there's, there's the communications that people need, and then there's the communications that people want. And sometimes those aren't always in agreement. Some people want more than what they need, but um, one way of managing that external communications is through social media. Reverse 911 works well. Um, and going to the traditional media, going to utilizing um, uh, the local TV station to help get the message out about what's going on is important as well. And it's important to integrate that into your plan because they're going to show up, and it's important to make sure that um, you're allowing for the ability to communicate with with the media and uh, and incorporate their their capabilities as well into your plan. And then the real important part for external communications is that single point of contact. Designate one person to be or one you know one agency and one person from that agency to be the voice of the team, especially if this starts to turn into a major case investigation, and we want to control the message that's going out because the message that's going out can impact the the um, the investigation. And it we I you see this in not just active shooters, but I would see this in uh, a lot of the um, the kidnapping deployments that I would go on not having a unified message would sometimes impair or, in, or impede the investigation. Now the big question is how do what are the keys to making all of this work? Flexibility. Uh, you know when we're talking about a crisis it's important to remain flexible and have the ability to adapt to what's going on. Adapt to changing environments. The changing conditions. For example, you know, we look at an active shooter as the traditional targeted violence where it's grievance based. Um, with, like, for example, a, um, an active shooter at a school, it may be a singular location, and oftentimes those, those, um, those types of events will end with the, with the, the shooter terminating his plan and, and uh, committing suicide. But we also have to be careful for um, 
the changing conditions and and being drawn into a protracted fight. So flexibility and adaptability is important. Equipment and personnel failures. You may expect people to get there that end up not making it for whatever reason, whether it's car accidents um, or or anything. Equipment failures, oftentimes equipment will fail on us and it's really important to be flexible when it comes to that. Adaptability, taking your taking your um, your tactics, whether it's uh, close quarter battle, CQB tactics to make entry into school, or if you have to be adaptable and it becomes an open air fight. The, um, the San Bernardino shooting started out as possible CQB inside the, uh, the venue, but then it became a, um, a run and gun battle in open air tactics. So the adaptability, we can't get locked into one type of training for one type of event. Active shooter tactics inside of a closed space is one thing, but then when the, uh, the shooter draws you into a, a protracted gun battle, it needs to be, you need to have some adaptability. Hybrid targeted violence, that's what we're kind of talking about. CQB versus open air tactics. And then obviously the real key is cooperation among a, amongst agencies. Often, you know, over a 26 year career, I've seen a lot of opportunities where um, people have allowed egos, their own egos, to, to impede their success. And I, I jokingly refer to um, the law enforcement speech impediment is where we can't say I need help or I'm willing to accept help. And really that cooperation is, is going to be the big, one of the biggest factors in being successful when it comes to these events. Organization, getting, the, getting everything organized in advance of the event is, is critical. This is where the planning comes in. This is talking to the people. And the more you can decide before the event, the better off you're going to be. And that will help facilitate that flexibility and adaptability. Incident command system, if you haven't taken the ICS classes, it's, um, it's a great way of organizing the resources in advance. And really what it does is it creates an organizational structure that multiple agencies can, can plug into. The, the important part is I've seen incident command system be utilized in an extremely rigid way where it actually impeded communication. Um, but if you maintain that flexibility and you um, and the adaptability, incident command system is a is a basically an organizational structure that can be overlaid in any crisis. And it was and it started back in the, I believe the 70s through uh, FEMA dealing with some of the um, the natural disasters and hurricanes that had occurred back then. And it's a way of bringing integration of monks, state, local, and federal resources. And then obviously collaboration, working together, especially in the planning phase, is, um, is a critical part. And you have to bring everybody to the table. Any stakeholder that could possibly be there or possibly show up to assist you in this needs to be at the, at the table when it comes time for planning. And then how do we ultimately, how do we make it all work? You know, you have to manage your expectations. Not everything's going to work well. Um, there's going to be failures. There's going to be parts of the system that'll break, but you have to kind of manage that. You have to plan on being overwhelmed. It's a very an event like this is can be can be overwhelming even for the most seasoned and the most experienced um, police officer or law enforcement officer, and even the ones that have um, years of experience. It can be overwhelming. But a big part of it is accepting the situation. An example of this, is for me, it, when it comes to acceptance, it's really acceptance versus resignation. When you accept a, an adverse situation that you're in, you're still looking for, solution, for solutions. When you resign yourself to it, you're not looking for the solutions anymore. And really, you have to, it's acceptance is that the mindset that you want. I would always, going into a, a, a child abduction uh, command post, I'd always know, knew going into it that the command post might not be set up or running in the most efficient way that it could be, but I accepted it and I didn't get hung up on it and we, we would look for solutions. And that's the important part. Acceptance allows you to find that solution and work forward. And a big thing is once you've stemmed the, the, the loss of life, there's always time to stop and take a breath. And I like to refer to it as restarting the OODA loop. And the OODA loop is a, a term that began in the, uh, was developed back in the late 40s by an, um, 
an Air Force commander, and it's observe, orient, decide, and act. And that's that's the process by which our we function. We have to observe what the problem is, get oriented to it, decide what we want to do, and then act and execute what our decision was, and then re-observe the effects on it. And in the middle of a crisis, that that loop can get disrupted, and that's where you know we kind of we kind of go into crisis mode internally, and we start to shut down. It really is important to take that breath, really orient and observe what the situation is, and start to orient yourself to it, and then start that loop, and that'll make you even more effective. And then the big thing is by doing that, it allows us to make more deliberate actions and not hasty ones. When we're deliberate in our actions and we're deliberate in our decision making, we are our most effective. When we start moving hastily, the decision making process gets disrupted and we start to lose that, that efficacy. Now, the kind of the final note here with when it comes to an active shooter or a mass casualty event is you have to plan for the long term. Once the crisis is resolved, once you've resupplied, it doesn't end there. You know, the event isn't over when everybody goes home. You have to start thinking long-term monitoring of personnel. And it's really in three phases. The short term is what's what we're doing in the immediate after, aftermath. For me, it was um, having a meeting the next day with our EAP personnel that were able to say to us, hey, here's what you can expect over the next few weeks. Um, for us, it was spontaneous recall of the images that we saw at the school. Um, that thin veneer, emotional um, fluctuations, uh, insensitivities, things like that. And that's going to be in the short term. So we kind of monitor for that. And what happens is when we start to get to the midterm, if we're still having some of those short term um, effects into the midterm, like months later, then it's time to really start taking a look at things. And then obviously anniversaries are a big part. Uh, they, can, they can affect personnel for the long term. And this is part of another presentation that I do with regards to um, mental health for, uh, for first responders and law enforcement. But the, this is something that can be overlooked and it really needs to be laid out um, in the planning phase. And then victim witness support, you know, the people that you're, that you're there to serve are going to have impacts. So I just want to ask one other polling question. Um, what do you think is the most important phase of the process to respond to an active shooter or mass casualty? All right, and I'll put that poll up. Um, so let's see. Responses are coming in, about 20% in. We'll give it another couple of seconds. And uh, there seems to be a clear consensus. So. That should be, I don't think we're going to change too, too much from what we got going on here. So let me close this out and share. Excellent. All right. Tom, we lost you there. We can't hear oh, you. Sorry, I just looked at the results. So, yeah, so I'm this pre-event planning and training really is the most critical phase of these deployments. Um, if you're not prepared uh, both mentally and logistically, it makes your deployment much more difficult. And as Sun Tzu even stated, you know, every battle is won before it's fought. And the way I, you know, when I look at that, um, when I look at that, that, that quote, it has many meanings. You know, I think Sun Tzu is referring to the political part of, of war, but for me, it's, you know, when before we even deploy, we, we know whether or not we've won or lost that fight, and it's all about getting the logistics, training, and preparation. That's really going to be the critical part, and the fact that you're here for this, this webinar is just another example of you taking the, the, that first good step towards um, being prepared. And I believe that's where we're at. So that's my contact information. If, um, if anybody wants to reach out at any point, I'd be happy to help out. So Sal, I'm going to turn it back over to you. 
Sure, that's great. Let me leave this up for a couple of seconds. I do have a really quick uh, presentation that I want to, piece of a presentation that I want to go through, but we've seen a lot of questions come in. There are a lot of great questions, and I do want to make time to go through them. So um, please take down this information in the next three seconds, three, two, one. And then, um, great. So let me, uh, let me go over a little bit of what I promise that we, I will leave, um, that I will leave uh, time for questions at the end with our speaker. So Tom, thank you so much. I just wanted to really get into really quickly um, just a little bit more about being prepared, about what preparedness means. So, um, uh, you know, we talk about pre-event planning, and especially, you know, uh, with the next step being notification. Um, you know, wh why did Everbridge have this presentation in the first place? Well, it, you know, we help companies be prepared. So let's talk about preparedness. Um, to be prepared means you have to have the right information. Information is key. Um, when, it, when you're trying to prepare, you need to uh, realize that people's lives depend on how fast you can move. And um, you also need to get information into the right people, the people that are both going to save the day and the people that are going to get in trouble. So let's talk about some functional considerations in order to uh, accomplish those objectives. So, um, so when it comes to speed, you know, active shooter incidents last around 12 minutes. Um, it is the average uh, for the various types of active shooter incidents. So in order to, to execute on that quickly, to avoid mistakes, um, the biggest recommendation that I can make is to automate the process. Um, you want to be accurate with your information. So that means that that, that situational intelligence that you're going to want um, telling you kind of what's going on and where, you want that to be highly accessible to those people that are informing the others. You want that to be, you know, preferably in a, in a single system. That, uh, that that's the same system that you're using to manage the entire incident. And then really to communicate. Um, we like to talk about multimodal communications. You want to, you're, you're going to want to communicate on as many channels as you possibly can, especially when you're talking about the public. So that means, you know, SMS, text message, emails, voicemail, social media. Um, the more channels you're communicating through, the li higher likelihood that you're getting information out into someone's hands. Um, and you want to be very location specific with your, inf with your communication. You want maps. You want polygons. Uh, uh, our, our speaker Tom talked about scene management. Um, this is part of scene management: is you may need to communicate one message to people who are in danger in one area, and then another message to people who are not necessarily in danger in another area, so the situation doesn't get worse. Um, and you need to be, in order to communicate, you need to be able to find resources um, so that you can allocate those resources and communicate to those people who are are in charge. Um, and that's where Everbridge comes into play. So Everbridge is software that that helps organizations respond to organizations respond to critical events to keep people safe and businesses running. Um, although today's presentation was about active shooter um, management and mass mass casualty events, um, Everbridge has helped uh, thousands of customers uh, with different types of critical events. So we um, you know we've helped them coordinate through these events. We need to make sure that our system is scalable flexible and reliable so that it's it's um, so it can be used for various types of events so with that I will get to the audience Q&A I will put up one last poll in the meantime um, just quickly about if you would like to hear from Everbridge so give me one second and then I'll shut that down um, so let me launch this would you like to talk to Everbridge about your uh, um, about this but let me um while that's up, Tom, if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll start the audience Q and A. So again, please do submit your questions through the Go to Webinar um, through the Go to Webinar uh, Q and A uh, functionality. Um, but Tom, there's one one thing that you mentioned uh, that that got a lot of response. Is you talked about you did that walkthrough at the mall. You noticed that during that uh, the course of that walkthrough, uh, you found locations where your communication was was not oper uh, you know, operable. Um, how do you select those? Areas that you want to do walkthroughs for, and you know what's the um, so I guess what's the criteria for the selection, and kind of how many do you recommend uh, for someone who's interested in this? Oh, that's a lots of good question. What the, the reason we ended up going to one of the malls is it was an initiative that we were doing for the FBI, and it was basically um, responding to a mall attack um, as a result of the Westgate Mall attack in in, um, in Africa, and what we started to do after that is we started to look for critical infrastructures, and it, it really comes down to the, you know, I like to call it the hair on the back of the neck um, gauge. You know, looking around your AOR 
and uh, look at the different critical infrastructures in your that you're responsible for, and you have to kind of war game it a little bit and look at where what venue would present itself as being particularly challenging. And we looked at the several malls here in Connecticut, and we ended up doing a couple different ones. And it was a good opportunity for us to work with uh, state and local um, SWAT teams and command staff. And we ended up doing two major uh, mall exercises. We got the cooperation of the mall. And it's really, it boils down to, you know, where are the venues in your area that that you are the most concerned with, and that's a good starting point. The big thing is, I don't think you can develop a plan for every particular location, but you can take the fundamental plan of for a, for a large area or a large venue, develop that, and oftentimes it'll be the same the same stakeholders that'll respond, and you can use the use that as your your structure, and that's where the flexibility and adaptability come. You can adapt the plan from one venue to another. And it helps you think through the process in advance of the crisis. Sounds great. Um, no, that's great advice. So I have another question here. Um, this is a question from Jody. What are the keys to success you've experienced for a company to response to respond and coordinate with public responders? What are the key elements that should be in the company's response plan? The I, the the biggest and I think the most critical element is developing the plan with them, with law enforcement. I've, I've seen oftentimes, whether it's a school, a hospital, or another institution that will develop a plan for an active shooter, or re, and I like to refer to those as the reaction plans. They're reacting to the active shooter because they're the, they're the victim in this case. And certain assumptions are made that may be inaccurate, um, and certain expectations may be made that will never happen and it's important to incorporate the the primary law enforcement agency that is going to respond to your aid is to incorporate someone from that agency to help you develop the plan and that's where that communication starts great um, you know what Tom I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you the presenter again uh, I have a couple people asking for your contact information so just to let, let everybody know and you could, if you could put that slide up with your contact info um, we will be emailing out uh, Tom's contact info uh, with the follow-up. And again, for those of you who need um, who need the slides and the presentation, uh, we will we are recording today's presentation, and we will be emailing out those slides and the recording Friday or Monday. So please do keep an eye out for those. Um, Tom, I have another question here. Um, would you explain open air tactics? CBQs. Uh, what's the difference uh, for someone who, uh, someone new at this? So, um, it's close quarter battle is a is a tactic that's or a, a a a system of tactics that we would incorporate if we were to go inside of a structure. So, for example, if we were to make an entry into a school or a business, those would be considered close quarter battle tactics, and they and we utilize the structure. We use utilize the the floor plan as a way of both making our advance and protecting ourselves from from hostile actors. When you have open air tactics, it is more about working outside of a structure and moving through open ter open terrain. And so, when you're looking at those two environments, the 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 tactics are different are different, and it's um, you know, it's law enforcement tactics for both of them, but you have to take a different different approach. Great. So uh, I know it's a little bit past three, but Tom, if you don't mind, if we could say a couple more minutes, I did. I promised some people that we would answer their questions. So yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. All right. This is a long one, but it's a good one. So I'll just go ahead and read it. We have a mass notification system that we use within our company. We've identified a gap in our process between when an active threat occurs in one of our facilities where 911 has been called, so emergency services are being deployed and we need to inform the rest of the organization that something is occurring at the location and to avoid the area that is um, area as well as to con contact the staff who are in the middle of the event with additional information. How does the information get to the outside of the actual event who can issue the notification in a timely fashion? 
Well, that's a good question because oftentimes we see that the the person that would be making that notification to the outside is actually impacted by the event. And you know, it can be something very rudimentary. It can be a panic alarm, it can be um an uh, overhead paging system. I know that in some some buildings they they still have the inability to um activate a paging system throughout all their their campus and that can be a challenge so really it's it has to be you have to be able to get that communication out through some sort of broadcast system trying to get to a mass notification system while you're under fire is going to be challenging and that's where that messaging needs to be done remotely so I know in um, in some areas or some hospitals there's a a, um, a cryptic message that can be that can be um, broadcast from any phone inside the inside the facility whether it's um, you're you're announcing a, a cardiac issue or you're announcing a fire or an active shooter and I think that really can be the starting point and it's when you have that have that broadcast ability that's where you can get the the message out quickly and then the details of that message can be can be um, pushed out by an out, you know, a remote party, and really, when you're using a mass notification system, pre-canned messages are the best way to do it. So I don't know. Hopefully, that answers the question. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully as well. I'll just tell you, just um, from an Everbridge perspective, um, you know, we've helped a lot of clients with uh, preparing for these kinds of events and dealing with these kinds of events. Uh, as Tom mentioned, um, the automation of this and having templates is. Um, is the key to a quick response. Again, as he mentioned, you know, if you're under fire, that's that's another issue. But if you do have someone that is, you know, monitoring these events and knows that building A is under a run hide fight order, building B is shelter in place because you don't want someone from building E, so building B, excuse me, fleeing into the path of the shooter. Um, having those templates ready to go and launched in a very in as few clicks as possible from an emergency manager or PIO or whatever it is. Um, that that really is the key. Uh, th that's the recommendation we make for Everbridge for people using um, NAS notification. Again, we also have location functionality, depending on if you're an office or if you're a you know state or local government or a city or something like that. Um, <clears throat> uh, location functionality in terms of drawing polygons or you know predefined uh, you know shapes that you can use on a map, that sort of thing. So there are some options out there that you can explore. Um, I got two really good questions that I really want to try to squeeze in here. Um, so one is um, guidance for uh, people with disabilities that are unable to, f to follow the run, hide, fight protocol. Oh, that's a, that's a good one because that's where um, if you're in, in a, um, a corporate setting, um, that's where life safety monitors can be critical. They can be in they can help facilitate the evacuation of those per of that of the, those personnel. The big thing is when it comes to run hide fight, we push this message out um, of what we're supposed to do. But what people fail to do is develop their own personal safety plan. And I always tell tell people in the private sector, you know, it's one thing to understand the concept of run hide fight, but you need to sit at your workstation and war game it. If and say to yourself, if I hear what sounds to be gunfire, where am I going to run? And oftentimes people will have, you know, especially when it comes to like college students, they'll know where to plug in their phones at the student union, but they won't know where the exits are. So part of that needs to be a personal safety plan that the individual develops. And it's important that um, as a, an employer, if you have a person with disabilities, it's to engage them and talk to them about, hey, what, you know, where do you want us to take you? Where are you going to go? And where it becomes challenging is, you know, I think the biggest challenge is when it comes to the run hide fight for um, anyone is when you're not at your workstation. When you, you know, you're on your way back from the break room or you're the cafeteria or the cafe, we have we war game it from where we're sitting, but we don't war game it from every from every venue. And it really boils down to kind of having that. Situational awareness, and I always call it developing a good, healthy paranoia. Hmm. Yeah, and I'll just add really quickly to that. You know, here at Everbridge, you know, we we um, just focusing on the, the hospitals that we have as clients. 
uh, this comes up a lot, kind of uh, to, to, to piggyback off what Tom said, is it's, it's all in the preparation. Um, you know, war game it out both personally and for the organization. Um, it's also important, especially from a hospital perspective, to understand kind of what, it, what are the roles, what are the responsibilities, what is the liability. Um, hospitals are one of the workplaces that have uh, the highest rates of active shooter incidents. Um, so, you know, it, it's worth in your planning stage to just consider, you know, where are, you know, what, what are we going to do with the patients, essentially, <laughs> is the question that, that you're asking. What is our responsibility to the patients um, when, when a run, hide, fight, uh, message goes out. What does that mean for our patients, and especially those that that uh, that are disabled and can't really follow that? So it is something to include in your planning. Um, I have one last question, Tom. I apologize to everybody who can't get um, get their question to. It's a long question, but I'll try to boil it down to basically um, when you're talking about interconnected radio systems, um, how do you avoid clogging the radio systems with too much traffic? You mentioned during the San Bernardino terrorist attack, there are three uh, radio talk groups. Um, so, you know, there's multiple buildings. Um, one channel is not feasible to handle all that traffic. So, so uh, basically, on a holistic scale, you know, how do you recommend using the interoperability when it comes to radios? That, well, that's a, that is actually a really really good question. As the um, the way our team would operate is in a SWAT element, we would have our an internal frequency that was just our internal net was essentially just the operators that were op, were conducting tackle, tactical operations inside the venue. They would be on one frequency, and the team leader would have one radio for that. But then we'd also have a second radio that was on a command uh, frequency, and really, it's a it's a, a matter of breaking down and. Um, and segmenting the communications. When it comes to um, having multiple SWAT teams at multiple venues, we would have a tactical operations center, and they would handle just the communications for those for those tactical operators. Um, we might be in a major event where you're going to ultimately you'll need multiple radio systems with basically kind of those communication nodes. So one delegating one person to be the the tactical operations center to do the communications with the teams and reporting back to the incident commander. You may have um, an EMS commander or an EMS net, uh, radio network that would communicate with the radio, um, with the uh, the EMTs and the the ambulances. But that all goes back to it basically reports back up to the incident commander. So you don't you can't use one frequency for everything. Um, and you know using the patrol as a um, as a good example, the main dispatch, a lot of agencies will have the main dispatch frequency, but then they'll go to a secondary channel to do their internal operations. So if you have an active shooter, you have, they may get dispatched over the, the, the primary dispatch frequency, but then they may, they'll likely move to a secondary frequency or secondary channel once they get to the venue and start conducting their operation. Sounds good. Thank you so much. We're way over time. But we did. We had a lot of the audience stick around, so I think that they don't mind. Um, thank you to everybody who asked questions, and um, most most uh, most importantly, thank you to our speaker, Tom Vivia. Um, thank you so much. The, the content was great. Um, I, I did leave the contact information up there. So uh, so to our audience, again, look for a recording of our presentation emailed out to you. Um, either by Friday or Monday, if you don't record it, excuse me, if you don't receive it, please do let us know. I hope everybody enjoyed it, and I hope everybody um, takes this to heart and takes a look, a fresh look at their plans if necessary, and formulates their plans if they haven't. So, Tom, thank you so much. Well, my pleasure. Glad I could be here. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, and we'll talk to you soon.